this computer. Okay. Hi, everyone. Today, we are very happy to have Jennifer Lin um, from Oxford uh, giving a talk on a new look at the gravitational entropy formula. Thanks for accepting to give a talk and please. Yeah, so um, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, so this talk will mostly be based on these last three things that I put on the archive. Uh, one was from a while back and two from this past July and aspirationally maybe some work to appear in the future. Okay, so, so let me um, set the stage with like a really big picture introduction. Um, so one, one question that we would all like to know the answer to is um, what are the atoms of space time? Or in other words, um, what are the natural degrees of freedom that would let us efficiently formulate a theory of quantum gravity from which we could get back to GR on the one hand, um, but also maybe be able to answer any question that we might want to ask about quantum black holes on the other hand, like um, explaining the origin of the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy or seeing how the information paradox is resolved in a direct bulk calculation. Um, and, and at least to me, it seems that our biggest clues towards understanding this from across the work of the last 50 years um, have been indeed the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy formula itself, or more generally black hole thermodynamics for giving us sort of the targets that such a description should aspire towards explaining. Um, and then ADS-CFT for giving us the most concrete theoretical laboratory that we have where we can try to make sense of some of these ideas. Um, and, and in more recent times, it's become extremely fruitful to combine these two things. Um, in particular, to use the dictionary entry for entropy and ADS-CFT to shed light on both the outstanding questions around black hole physics and on the nature of um, ADS-CFT itself. Um, so that dictionary entry um, that kickstarted all of this was the Ryotakinagi um, formula that says that in states of holographic CFTs with Einstein gravity duals, the um, fine grade entropy of a region B in the CFT is given by the area of the minimal area um, external surface B tilde that's homologous to it in the bulk, um, plus the von Neumann entropy of the quantum fields appearing in the bulk region enclosed by B and B tilde. Um, and since, since it was written down, this formula has been generalized in many directions, most recently to this uh, so-called island rule for computing the entropy of non-gravitational systems coupled to gravity that um, surprisingly allowed us to find the correct page curve in some toy models of evaporating black holes. Um, but we still don't know why this formula is true from a canonical point of view. So, so the, the history right, was that um, at first it was just a conjecture that a lot of positive evidence was collected for. And then um, in 2013, it was proved using a Euclidean gravity argument where basically we, we assume that the unreplicated boundary manifold for this region B itself has a geometric deal and we proceed from there. But we don't know how to interpret that argument from like a Lorentzian point of view. Um, in, in other words, the open question that we still want the resolution to is to explain basically how we could write down some exact family of density matrices whose von Neumann entropies in some parametric limit would give rise to, to this formula, um, with the hope being that the associated Hilbert space basis would be the natural set of variables with which to formulate this, um, this long-awaited theory of quantum gravity that would include non-trivial black holes and so on. Can I ask a question here, Jennifer? Yeah. So I'm a little bit confused about uh, the, this point you just made. So um, there is an argument slash proof about uh, using the Euclidean path integrals, which goes through replica trick. And within the rules of ADS-CFT, we believe that if you sow rows, there will be a geometry in the bulk that will correspond to is the gravitational saddle point corresponding to that uh, trace, uh, trace of row n, right? So uh, let's say if I was just using replica trick in a finite quantum system, um, I can calculate uh, entanglement entropy using uh, replica trick in a finite quantum system. What would be the analog of what you're trying to accomplish in real time in that picture? Is there, could it go wrong? Could there be, I, I'm trying to see the distinction between Lorentzian picture versus Euclidean picture and why is Euclidean picture not good enough? Um, I, I, I want to write down like the exact density matrix whose von Neumann entropy gives you the thing, which like you don't have to know if you just you turn the quick on the replica trick. Right? I see. So you want you want an expression explicitly for the density matrix. Um, right. I basically want to like like use use this formula as like a clue to understand how the holographic map works at the level of the Hilbert space. I see. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so, so, so in this talk, my goal will be to, to indeed try to make progress on this problem. Um, and, and my strategy will be to try to understand this formula by developing an analogy between it and some very similar looking formulas for entanglement entropy in um, emergent compact gauge theories. Okay, um, so, so, so this slide is a kind of a first look at the strategy in a, in a wordy diagram that I took from one of my uh, July papers. Um, and, and the idea is that we will proceed in three steps. Um, first, given a state in a holographic theory that we can set up with a Euclidean path integral, um, we will rewrite the, um, the, the gravitational entropy formula that computes the entanglement entropy for some subregion of the boundary theory in an unusual first order way. Um, where in particular, I'll, I'll replace the area term with a um, group theoretic measure for a non-compact group that I'll define more precisely as we go along. Um, using a recipe called the edge mode algorithm that I'll also define for you as we go along. Um, we'll then find a family of exact density matrices um, in a toy model that's inspired by a compact gauge theory that will turn out to have the exact same functional form as the way that I'll rewrite the, um, the gravity formula in step one, up to replacing the non-compact group theory measure in the gravity case with a compact group theory measure in the toy model. Um, in, in this toy model, these uh, density matrices will turn out to arise due to working in a Hilbert space that has a certain super selection sector structure. And if we then um, would go back to gravity and assume that the gravitational entropy formula arises due to a similar emergent super selection sector structure in ADSCFT, um, this will lead to like a somewhat provocative picture for how the holographic map might work. Um, yeah, so so, so um, I apologize if this slide is a little fast or hard to follow. It's just like a very high level overview and the rest of this talk will basically consist of me applying this strategy to a series of uh, concrete examples. So there will be lots of opportunities for you to ask me questions about it and also for me to just define things better as we go along. Right, can I ask you a quick question actually here? Um, yeah. So the, the first block that you start with is completely in the, on the boundary, right? Um, that's right, yeah. So the next block, you're, you're talking about gauge theory. This gauge theory is on the boundary or in the bulk? Um, uh, yeah, so in the first block, I will, I will rewrite the, I mean, it, like the, in, the, in the first block, like the, the, um, the entropy, that we compute from the boundary can also be interpreted as um as like an area term plus corrections in the book, and then in the second block I will write down a um an like a, a gauge theory toy model that's supposed to be a toy model for the book. I'll, I'll identify a term in the toy model that's supposed to map to the area term. Okay. Yeah. Does, does so that, this, this edge mode this edge mode story? I mean, block two, third, and fourth is all in the bulk. But is you're using some sort of a first order formals and for gravity. Um, yes, so, yes. So I basically will rewrite will rewrite RT in first order um, in the bulk, and then um, and then write a gauge theory, a compact gauge theory model that's supposed to be an analog of the bulk. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, yeah, if, if it's if it's not clear, maybe ask, ask me again in like ten minutes when I show you the first example. Like hopefully, hopefully it will be it will be very clear then. Okay. Um. Yeah. So. So. Um. The, before I get into the example, just just to um to to watch your appetite. Here's like the really speculative picture that I think we end up being led to if we take take these analogies very seriously. Um. So. So in, in three dimensional gravity, and also with a related picture, we would further reduce to two dimensions. Um. I'll, I'll land on a conjecture that there may exist an approximate description of space itself as being built from entangled conformal block-like atoms that redundantly encode um, semi-classical states. In which the RT area terms can be rewritten as um, as, as plectral measures for a quantum group that will tell us how to glue together the legs of these conformal blocks and the different atoms. Um, so th these words are ridiculously vague for now, and you have you should have absolutely no reason to believe that they're true. But my goal of the rest of this talk will be to present the um, the evidence around why, and in what sense, I think something like this might be true. Um, so for now, it's sort of an, an advertisement or promise that we'll actually go some that we're actually going towards something interesting as I get into the the um, nitty gritty details of this analogy. So, um, so with that, let me get started with the main parts of this talk. Um, so I'll, I'll first apply this three-part strategy to states in pure JT gravity that can be set up with a Euclidean path integral in SYK JT holography. 
Um, and I'll then apply it to states in SYKJT holography that, again, can be set up by a path integral, but now with an operator inserted somewhere along the Euclidean boundary. Um, and finally, I'll apply it to the problem of computing the entanglement entropy of a single interval in the generic holographic 2D CFT. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so in this first example, um, we will work with JT gravity on a line interval with asymptotically ADS boundary conditions. Um, JT gravity is a theory of a metric in two dimensions coupled to a dynamical scalar field that's we usually call the dilaton. Um, here I've written its action, the um, equations of motion that follow from it, and the boundary conditions. Um, and these equations have a one parameter family of classical solutions that look like two-sided black holes with some non-trivial profile for the dilaton at every point in these two-dimensional backgrounds. And um, when we quantize them, they will give rise to a continuous one-parameter Hilbert space. Uh, one natural basis for this Hilbert space that we can use will be provided by the hartle hawking states, which are the states we can set up by doing a Euclidean path integral on a half disk with an open cut long line interval. Um, and in that case, the, um, the circumference of the disk can be taken as the continuous parameter that labels the states. Now, an important fact about JT gravity is that um, it's the bulk side of an especially a simple example of holography. Um, being att attainable in a double scaling limit, sometimes called a Schwarzen limit, from two coupled SYK models, um, where the SYK model is a quantum mechanical system of fermions with a random for Fermi coupling, um, whose details will not matter at all for this talk. You should just know that, that JT gravity does have a holographic deal. Uh, can I ask another uh, question? Do you mind going yeah. back to the previous slide? Maybe, maybe you clarify this, in which case, uh, just ignore it for now. But when mm -hmm. you said, so you, you, there is a one parameter family of two side black holes. And yep. when you say upon quantization, so you pick one such black hole and you construct the Hilbert space around that back black hole solution with asymptotic uh, boundary conditions. Is that what you mean? Um, no, it's like every 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 um, different black hole solution is supposed to correspond to a different state. So uh, th th that's why I guess what I was asking. Fix the uh -huh. black hole, right? Uh -huh. You construct a perturbative Hilbert space around that black hole. Is that right? So that for each black hole, you, you obtain a different Hilbert space and you have a one parameter family of Hilbert spaces. Is that what you mean? Um, so yeah, for, 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 for each black hole, each black hole corresponds to exactly one state in the Hilbert space and the parameter is like the, the temperature of the different black holes. So oh, it's like there's kind, of, yeah, kind of, yeah, there's, kind of, there's kind of like nothing else going on in this theory. You sort of just have these yeah, like you're just calls. you're just quantizing the theory with two boundaries. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah. So 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 starting from this theory. Um, so suppose we take one of these hurdle hawking states, um, and we're going to compute the entanglement entropy between the two SYK models um, in the Schwarzian or holographic limit. All right, so the, this cartoon is supposed to represent my setup where these SYK models are the red dots. Um, we're interested in the stage you set up by doing the, the Euclidean path integral on this black arc. And um, yeah, we want to find the entanglement entropy between the SYK models in the limit that there is also a, a bulk description that lives on this dotted line. Um, and from the bulk point of view, this, this state we set up can be thought of as like the, the t equals zero slice of one of these eternal black holes. And we're basically computing the entanglement entropy across the horizon. Um, so if you if you do the the given talking thing, this you can show that the this entanglement entropy can be written up to a constant as the horizon value of the dilaton divided by four G Newton. Um, and this expression of the horizon value of the dilaton over four G Newton is the analog of the Bekenstein Hawking area term in JT gravity, where there's no um, like geometric area term because the co-dimension two surfaces are points in one plus one dimensions. Um, so, so these are some of like the, the standard results from like from like 2015 or something. And, and what I want to do now is rewrite this formula in an unusual way with an eye towards comparing that the new way that I'll write it to a similar looking formula that I'll, that, that I'll then get from a compact gauge theory to another. Okay, and um, so, so, so to do that, um, we will use the replica trick to compute the entanglement entropy where um, the, the unreplicated partition function in this case is the Schwarzschild partition function um, on a disk with an n times longer circumference than the one that we use to set up the state. And we um, we know how to know the explicit formula for this partition function thanks to Stanford and Witten. 
Um, but now instead of just directly plugging this guy into the replica trick formula, um, I want to pause here and rewrite Zn in a funny way. So in terms of this quantity P sub K that I've introduced um, um, here in like a totally arbitrary way for now, whose physical meaning I'll explain for you in a second, we can rewrite it as shown in the bottom line. Um, so yeah, so these, these steps probably seem like really random right now, but just bear with me for another slide or two. My original motivation for doing these manipulations was that a similar series of steps was used by Will Donnelly to derive the, these, some formulas in entanglement entropy and compact cage theories that I keep alluding to. Sorry, can I can I ask a question regarding the yeah. Donnelly work? So uh, this is many years ago, but there was a discussion about how do you properly define entanglement entropy for gauge theories. There oh. is a definition that you come uh, that that you get from the Euclidean path integral. There was one definition like that, and then there was another definition which was had to do with you know lattice gauge theory. There will be a center for associated with these edge modes and such. Yep. Am I am I understanding this correctly? That Will Donnelly said that explained why the Euclidean path integral gener uh, is the matches this real-time approach, right? Of picking a center and these edge modes. Is, am I, am I yeah, yeah. Right? So, so he explained how the Euclidean path integral matches onto a, like a particular choice of, um, like a particular prescription that you use on the lattice. And, um, and I, I think I'll review it in a second. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, ask me again in like two slides. Um, yeah, so so if we if we plug this way of writing of writing um, this unreplicated partition function into the replica trick, then we find that the entanglement entropy between the two SYK models can be written as like um, this sum of like a Shannon entropy for this distribution p sub k plus a second term that involves the integration measure from the disk partition function. Where uh, moreover, this second term evaluated at the peak of the distribution defined by p sub k turns out to equal the um, the Bekenstein Hawking area term from the bulk description of this Hartle Hawking state. Um, so, this, this, um, this second fact agrees for all possible values of beta. So, it's been checked across one continuous parameter for now. Um, you may or may not find this like interesting, but later on, I'll show that this match between this, um, this measure and the area term will agree up to perturbations as well. Um, so, so so the interesting thing about this k sinh 2 pi k thing is that it's a plantural measure for a, um, principal continuous representations in the positive semigroup of SL2R. Um, so this simple set of manipulations already suggests a curious interpretation of the area term um, in terms of group theory. And this idea that we should map extra areas to, um, to, to group theoretic measures will be a recurring theme in this talk. Um, it, it will turn out to be somewhat easier to interpret if we actually go up a dimension. So I'll come back to it um, in part three. Um, but, but, but to summarize though, all that I actually did so far was to just um, exactly rewrite some well-known entropy results by juggling around some manipulations in a kind of arbitrary way. So, so the physics content will be in how we should um, interpret this, this new way of writing things. And um, in order to explain that, let me know We'll move on to the second step where I'll write down a, a, a compact gauge theory situation that will give us um, an entropy formula that looks very similar on the one hand, but where we'll also know the exact density matrix that gives rise to it on the other hand. Can I, get, can I ask a quick question? Sorry yeah. for frequent interruptions. So you started with Zn uh, partition functions, right? Um, yeah. In the standard language of uh, what a partition function in quantum mechanics, you could inverse Laplace transform that, and you will get density of states. Yes. Right? Uh, that density of states is going to be this PK, or, yeah, I'm a little confused about that. Is, is that density of states going to be related to the curl measure, or? Um, that density of states is exactly this, this, um, this log k such 2 by k. So, right, the Zn, Zn was this formula back here. Um, so, sorry. The, so, so the, uh, the inverse of plus transform of it will give you the PK. Um, well, what is the definition of inverse of plus transform? Of the of the of the oh, you just, you just, you know, like uh, you go on the complex plane, you can we continue on the complex plane. And I mean, that, that's, that's you, the, the standard justification for uh, the replica trick. That's usually what we say in words. And for a replica trick, why replica trick works. Uh, but mm -hmm. all right, uh, okay, so maybe maybe this will come clear. Thank you. 
yeah, uh, well, the, this 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 case is two by k is is um it it is the density of states in this theory. Um, but yeah, I I, I, I maybe can't address it in in the language of music. Okay, so let, let me let me keep going for now. Um, yeah, so so what I want to do now is is write down um, uh, write down a toy model where we get to a very similar looking formula, but where we um we we know that the exact density matrix that gives rise to the formula, um, and this um and then, so this non gravitational system that I want to look at next it will be um, a pure two D Engels theory on a spatial S one with a compact gauge group G. Um, and an, an orthonormal basis for its Hilbert space is provided by representations of G. And given an arbitrary state in this theory, um, suppose that we want to compute the entanglement entropy across an interval I of the spatial S1. Right? Now, now there's a problem that, that you mentioned earlier, which is that the Hilbert space doesn't factorize across, um, across the ends of the interval due to Gauss's law. So this prevents us from doing the usual thing where we just um, take a naive partial trace and we have to figure out what to do about it. Um, and and to get around this, one one very naive thing that we can try to do is to embed this physical Hilbert space into a larger one where we lift the gauge group by fiat at the endpoints of the interval, um, so turning it into, into a global symmetry at the ends of the interval. Um, in other words, we will add in pairs of fictitious surface charges that in all possible representations um, at the ends of this interval i. And these um, these new surface charges will allow us to cut the flux lines so that we will end up with a larger factorizable Hilbert space and can compute some answer for the integrable entropy with respect to it. Um, now, now this this way of extending the Hilbert space will not at all be unique. Right? We could just as well have extended it by merely like doubling each state across the cut, or on the other extreme by putting in like a huge number of extra degrees of freedom at the ends of the cut. So it's a very specific choice we're making, where we sort of um, we sort of privilege Gauss's law, take it to be a physical constraint equation that's to be lifted. Um, but but indeed, this is what ends up agreeing with the um, with the with the path integral result. And um, you can also argue that if um, if this gauge theory happens to be emergent from a local lattice theory with sides around the spatial S one, then this prescription will give you back the microscopic entanglement entropy of the UB theory um, up to a zero point entropy. Um, so. Uh, but uh, yeah, and also, also, I guess, but also for the purpose of this talk, these details actually don't matter so much. You can just take this to be a technical step on the way to getting the density matrix whose fundamental entropy will look like the gravity formula that we want to explain. Um, so, so let me let me take uh, take this prescription at face value and proceed. Um, if we would embed the physical Hilbert space in the extended one that I just defined, Gauss's law will require us to pair up fictitious surface charges along the ends of the cut. So the physical Hilbert space actually will be embedded into a, um, a subspace of the extended one with super selection sectors labeled by representations R. Um, and now we can we can take a generic state from the physical theory embedded in this larger Hilbert space and compute the reduced density matrix for one of the tensor factors in this larger space. And the reduced density matrix then will turn out to be um, will turn out to be this block diagonal guy whose von Neumann entropy is this boxed equation below. Um, and, and so this, this formula looks pretty similar to, to the way I rewrote the gravitational entropy formula a second ago. Um, but, but what we have here that we didn't have before is we knew that we know the exact density matrix here that gives us this answer. So we can see that this first term is the Shannon entropy for which super selection sector we're in. And the second term comes from taking the trace over the identity matrix in each, in each block of this diagonal density matrix. That's like, counting the maximal entanglement between the magnetic indices within each sector. Uh, sorry, can I ask a... Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask a naive, naive question? Um, so yeah. when you think of this embedding, um, is there any constraint on it or do you embed on into uh, like just a larger Hilbert space or... Um, so, so I defined a, a specific larger Hilbert space, which is the one you get when you... Um, when, when you when you add when you add surface charges in all possible representations to the endpoints uh -huh. of the interval I. And and so oh, okay, in, in this, okay. yeah, and this the second formula from the top here is like the the embedding that's forced by this particular extension. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Sure. 
Uh, can I also ask you a quick question? Uh, yeah. So in, uh, there is one tiny difference uh, between the two Hilbert spaces. The initial one that you started with uh, was a circle, right? So it had no boundaries. Yeah. And the, the, you get two copies of theories with boundaries. Uh, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I guess that's for the one. Yeah, this this will also this will also keep on being a theme. Like like every place, I, I will end up doing an integral calculation, including in higher dimensions. I basically will want to like like cut out some infinitesimal region around the boat. The reason I'm I'm saying this is that in quantum field theory, there is a there exists. This is full quantum field theory. There is a rigorous yeah. map that will map the Hilbert space of a single copy of the theory to two copies of the theory, but not change in boundary conditions. So h goes to h tensor h. There exist such unitaries. But we could discuss this offline, maybe. Oh, okay. So it maps, it maps a single copy of the Hilbert space to exactly two copies of the same Hilbert space. Exactly. Is it? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, so that that's that's not what I'm doing here because I'm, I, I'm sort of adding in like many charges at the end. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so, so to summarize, like everything that that, that we covered so far. Um, so, so in in this in this setup. First, on the gravity side, um, I rewrote the analog of the RT formula in a hurdle hawking state of JT gravity in this first order way, where this uh, k sinh 2 pi k measure can be matched to the um, JT gravity analog of the area term. Um, while on the gauge theory side, I found the second equation as the explicit von Neumann entropy of this block diagonal matrix that came from taking a partial trace in a Hilbert space with uh, super selection sectors labeled by the representations R. Um, so if if we would now make the assumption that the um, gravity formula comes from a density matrix with a similar um, similar block diagonal structure, so like the von Neumann entropy of a density matrix with blocks labeled by SL2 R representations K, um, it would be natural to conjecture that um, one this this uh, theory of two SYK models um, should have states that are labeled by SL2 R representations K in the Schwarzen limit, um, i.e. JT gravity should have such states. Um, and two, each copy of the SYK model should have Hilbert space sectors that get labeled by SL2 representations K and Schwarzen limits, where some entangled combination of the states in these sectors between these two copies of the SYK model would get mapped to the states in the first bullet point. Can I ask a question here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so basically, you're com uh, comparing von Neumann entropies, so entangled entropies in the gravity set and in the Gauge theory side, can we also compare higher Rainier's? And if they are also the same, then wouldn't that just mean that the density matrices are also identical? We won't have to assume that, um, right? Um, so I, well, I mean, the, 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 these density matrices are, like these two formulas are not exactly the same, right? Like the measures are different. Um, but in, ter yeah, in oh, terms of what okay. it, in terms of what it would look like if you compared the higher readies, I, I I would guess it would probably work out the same, but I haven't tried it. So so yeah, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Actually, can I uh, can I yeah. say when in the when in the line that you say, if we assume that gravity formula comes from a density matrix, am I mm -hmm. can I interpret this this way that you're assuming that the Hilbert space of gravity is given is equivalent to a, a SL2R gauge theory. Um, yeah, I think that's that's fair. Or yeah, that it had... right. So now now there's one thing that I, maybe maybe you're going to explain this. That uh, if, if if you are, please ignore it. Uh, the mm -hmm. SL2R gauge theory; these representations are continuous. Yes. Uh, and the the analog. Well, maybe we'll discuss this. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I think I might truly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 you can ask if these um these these conjectures I'm making at the bottom here are surprising, and and, and in fact they are not at all surprising, um for, for reasons probably related to what you you're, you're getting. At. Um. So, so we actually already know that these two things are true because we know that gravity in this case has this SL two R description. Um. Right. Where where the the basis for which is labeled by the, like these um by these uh these principal continuous representations of SL2R. Um, and and um, so I guess, I guess in, in slightly more words, um, you, can, you can take JT gravity and write it in a first order way as an SL2R BF theory, 
that's like this uh, the the the, the, the two-dimensional analog of the formulation of 3D pure gravity as an SO2 entry in Simon's theory. Um, in, in that formulation, a natural basis for the Hilbert space is labeled by these principal continuous representations K of SL2R, which is, so K here is the, um, is like the one continuous parameter that labels the Hilbert space of JT gravity. Um, and, and we can now go back and check that this, um, this, this piece of K that I defined in a kind of random way earlier is in fact the square of the overlap of the hardle hawking wave function with these uh, states labeled by k in the representation basis of uh, the first order formulation of JT gravity. Um, so, so basically, this, um, this, 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 these conjectures I made are, are things that we already knew. And this, this whole example was like a sanity check that our, our strategy makes sense. Um, but, we've, but, but we'll find results that are more surprising when, when I apply the same strategy to some more complicated situations. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'll continue the question later after maybe explain more. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so, 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 so let me now move on to, the, to part two where, um, where I'll, 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 I'll discuss the uh, states of JT gravity where, but where we include um, an, an operator along the boundary of the Euclidean path integral that sets up the state. Um, so more specifically, uh, I now want to consider states obtained by cutting the Euclidean Schwarzian two-point function um, at the moment of time reflection symmetry um, for some arbitrary operator O of dimension L. Um, and at, at leading order in one over G Newton, such states um, turn out to describe wormholes in the bulk with now two horizons of different areas. Um, and, and moreover, the entanglement entropy between the two SYK models with this uh, perturbation of the path integral well, turns out to equal the smaller of these two horizon areas. Where, um, I'll, I'll soon review the derivation again in first order variables. Um, and so, so what, what I want to do here again is to start by rewriting this answer in a first order way, where, where I'll replace these, these areas with SL2R semigroup measures. Um, and then look for an exact family of density matrices in a compact gauge theory toy model that will give rise to an equivalent entropy formula where the non-compact plantral measure is replaced by, by one for a compact group. Um, I can then use an analogy between these two systems to interpret the physics in the gravity situation. Okay, so, so, um, so, so starting by, by manipulating this gravity formula, um, in this case, the unreplicated partition function would be the Schwartzian partition function on a thermal circle of circumference n beta with uh, 2n operator insertions along the boundary. Um, to, to really compute this thing, we should sum over all ways of contracting the operators, which we don't know how to keep track of in general, but to leading order in whatever G Newton, we can keep just the dominant channel, which is the one where we pairwise contract the operators that are closest together along the thermal circle. Um, which channel that is um, will we'll flip when tau goes from being less than or being greater than beta over two. Um, but if we specialize to tau less than beta over two without loss of generality, the, the, the picture that we want to compute is, is, is the one on the slide here. And we can write down what the, um, what the answer is using some rules that were worked out in a paper by these people. Um, and, and now following the same recipe, uh, again, define a somewhat ad hoc quantity that I'll, I'll call P. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. So the, yep. the periodicity of the thermal circle you drew, is it 2 pi or 2 pi n? Uh, 2 pi n. Oh, sorry, sorry, 2 pi n, thank you. Yeah, yeah so, so in, in, in terms of, um, so yeah, so, so again, I will define a, so this um, somewhat arbitrary quantity that I'll call PK1, K2, which at a technical level is the, it's the integrand of Z1 with both integrals stripped off. Um, and as before, we can rewrite Zn in terms of it and get to a formula for entanglement entropy in first order that looks pretty similar to the one from before. Um, and yeah, these, these details aren't very important. Um, so, that, so, so that was the result when tau is less than beta over 2. Um, if we then take into account that the dominant Euclidean channel switches when tau is greater than beta over 2, we get as the um, as the as the final answer for the first order calculation that that um, the way to rewrite this entanglement entropy between these two SYK models in first order form is this equation here here on the top um, to leading order in one over G Newton, where this p k sub one and p k sub two 
each come from marginalizing out the other variable in this PK1, K2 that I defined on the last slide. Um, and, and moreover, it turns out that again, the um, beckenstein hawking area term can be obtained by evaluating this measure at the, at the peak of this distribution defined by PK1, PK2. So, so in other words, this identification of the area term with this SL2R semigroup measure is um, robust up to, up to perturbations. Um, here it's robust up to independently varying these two continuous parameters of beta and tau. And in fact, we can check that it also holds if you add like any number of other operator insertions as well. Um, so I, I left out the steps for how, for, for how to show this because I think most of the details aren't that interesting. But the upshot is that at one point, a coefficient of two pi that you get from canceling the Hamiltonian and the free energy in the, in the gibbons hawking thing has to agree with the two pi that you get from directly taking the large k limit of this um, cinch. So, so it both um, seems clear why this always is true, but doesn't seem totally trivial to me. Um, okay, so, so, so to summarize, the, this finishes uh, step one, where we rewrite the gravitational entropy formula in this new situation in a first order form. Now, what's new in this example, relative to the one from the previous part, is that here, this entropy formula exhibits a phase transition between two different distributions, this uh, PK1 and PK2, as we tune tau, which is the parameter that tells us where along the boundary we put the operator. Um, now, such, such um, phase transitions as you tune a continuous parameter are of uh, considerable interest in light of this recent work on the black hole information paradox, where like a similar transition is responsible for giving the correct page curve. Um, and, and in fact, this particular setup that we're discussing here can, can basically be exactly mapped to the, uh, the, the toy model in the West Coast replica wormhole paper if we identify one of the two SYK models with the radiation system. So, so this raises an obvious question, which is, um, can, can we now try to understand what type of underlying um, exact density matrix might be able to give rise to such behavior um, in an entanglement entropy formula, starting from an exact compact gauge theory inspired toy model? Um, so of course, uh, I'm going to try to argue now that the answer is yes. Um, and and here, here's the toy setup that I can move into. You might yeah. be showing the, the previous slide, the one before this. I just want to start this expression. Uh, sure. So you started the ZN and uh, had, yeah, peak. So the, I'm trying to understand that maybe it was before this actually. Uh, so this is, this is the-, the Yeah, this, this is the equation I was looking for. Right, so. Oh, so you, uh, along the way, you just focus on the case where you have four operator insertions. Ah. Um, right, that's why you have K1, K2. Oh, uh, Sorry, I'm really confused. How many? Oh, oh, oh the, it's, it's the state that you that you have when you have one operator insertion. Um, so, what, so one operator insertion in that that, um, that sets up the state means two when you like two when you compute um, like z one right, and then two n oh, when you compute. Z1. I see. So there is a single operator that you that you inserted because you wrote right. the picture with many many operator insertions. I see. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I'm, I'm replicating this state with a single operator insertion. And oh, then I see. Okay, sorry. My, my apologies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much. Okay, but, but just, just, just to recap now, um, I, I want to find a exact density matrix that in a, in a gauge theory toy model that will, give, uh, that will give a very similar entropy formula to this formula at the top. Um, and so, so here's the setup for the toy model. Um, so consider now a compact lattice gauge theory on the lattice with uh, three links and two nodes, um, each of which will contain either node charge, which I've drawn as a, as a white circle on the left-hand side of this picture, or a static charge in some fixed representation R, which I've drawn as the orange circle. Um, and you can ignore the X for now. It's where I will want to compute the entanglement entropy in a second. Um, and moreover, um, let's specialize to the subspace of states where the middle link of the lattice is in either the same representation as the link to its left or as the link to its right. Um, so, so as a side comment, um, just like in 2D angles on S1, links of a lattice gauge theory can be labeled by representations of the gauge group. Um, and 2D, 2D angles on S1 is, is sort of like an example of a lattice gauge theory with a single link. Um, so, so on the right-hand side here, I drew the subspace that, um, that I want to specialize to, where 
the different colors on the link are supposed to denote which representation we're in. Um, and then and then at the bottom here, I wrote down the exact expression for 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 this family of states in a standard basis for lattice gauge theory. Um, and I'll keep I'll keep writing down these formulas and footnotes as we go. But throughout this discussion, I don't think the equations are are that important. Um, this, this picture of a three link lattice where the middle one is the same as the one to the left or right is what I should try to keep in mind. Um, so, so, so in this in this situation, suppose that we want to compute the entanglement entropy across the middle link. Um, as before, we would have the the same problem as in as in this two D A Mills case that the Hilbert space will not factorize across the cut. Um, but we can brute force our way around this using um, using this this um, prescription from Will Donnelly by introducing new pairs of surface charges along the cut in all possible representations of the gauge group. Um, so these added charges will will split this um, line into two intervals and allow all the flux lines to factorize at the ends of the interval. Um, and and once we make that prescription, there's again a unique embedding of the physical Hilbert space into this extended one, which will have this structure that I wrote here. Um, um, that comes from the fact that we have to pair up the new surface charges that we introduced to either side of the cut. Um, and at the bottom here, I again wrote the exact formula for embedding an arbitrary stead in the in this gauge theory into the extended Hilbert space. But the notation is not that interesting. You basically just kind of contract um, magnetic indices wherever you have to. Um, but the, the the point is that if if we now trace out the first two tensor factors of this um, of this state, then the then you can you 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 get some exact density matrix whose von Neumann entropy you can compute. And that von Neumann entropy will look like this, um, what I've written here, where now you see that there are terms that look like uh, P of R log P of R plus P of R log MR for two different distributions. Um, so uh, yeah, P, the, the PR and the PR prime. Um, and, and if we take P1 and P2 to be approximately oppositely oriented step functions, this entropy formula will look exactly the same as the first order uh, gravity formula that, that we set out to understand um, up to the replacement of the non-compact measure with this compact one. Um, so, so, so this, this is the, like a pretty dense bunch of equations. So let me, let me um, step back and summarize what, what we just did here. Um, so basically our, our goal was to find a toy model where we could mimic this um, first order gravitational entropy formula with like an entanglement phase transition. Um, and in order to, to, to mimic this phase transition, that uh, we need to find a situation that would let us switch between two expressions of the form P of R log P of R plus P of R log MR for different distributions as we tune the continuous parameter, all while we keep the actual location of the entanglement cut fixed. Um, since in the boundary theory here, we're always tracing out just one of two SYK models. Um, now, in these lattice gauge theory toy models, um, we associate a distribution over representations with a particular flux line on the lattice. And a flux line can non locally go across many links of the lattice as long as there are no sources in the way. So, in order to end up with a formula like the gravity one, what we want to do is to, is to consider a family of states where we let the entanglement cut. Um, effectively go through different flux lines on a lattice with a fixed underlying topology, all while we keep the actual physical location of the cut fixed. Um, and that, that's, what, um, that's what I tried to engineer here by specializing to this subspace of states on the right-hand side of this figure, where we let the middle link that the cut go through take on either the same representation as the link to its left or as the link to its right. So like in these two types of states, it, it goes through either one or the other of, um, of the two links on an underlying topological lattice with like two flux lines, even though the spatial position of the cut stays the same. And that's, that's, that's what allows us to, to get this um, entropy formula that looks the same as the gravity one. Um, yeah, so, so, so just to, to, to summarize and put the equations side by side. Um, Right, in, in this example, we have the, um, on the gravity side, this first formula on the top, um, the leading order, where again, the Bekenstein Hawking area term is this Planchard measure. On the gauge theory side, we found an exact family of density matrices that give the second formula. And the, these two formulas um, are the same if we, um, if we 
further specialized to states in the second case for which P1 and P2 are either zero or one. Um, so if we if we now play the same game and assume that um, that the gravity formula comes from a density matrix with the same block diagonal structure, we would be led to conjecture that in SYKJT holography, um, first of all, the theory of two coupled SYK models should contain states that are labeled by pairs of SL2R representations in a sorts of limit. And moreover, each copy of the SYK model should have uh, sectors of states that are labeled by pairs of SO2R representations, which can sort of redundantly encode the same um, representation basis data in the infrared. So for example, um, our, our hard hawking state can receive contributions from tensor products of these two different types of sectors, where each of the colored blobs here is supposed to represent like an entire sector in this equation is kind of schematic. Um, so, so the first of these two points is, is, already, is, I think, already known. It's the generalization of the representation basis in JT gravity to, 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 to include matter. And, um, but the second point, I, th I think, is new and was the, the main point of um, the first of my July papers. Um, yeah, OK, OK. So, so, so let's, let's uh, take stock of where we are. So to, to summarize, um, Right. So far, in, in, in parts one and two, I, I made some conjectures about the Hilbert space structure in SYKJT holography, conditioned on assuming that an analogy between SYKJT holography and compact gauge theory toy models leading to similar looking entropy formulas would hold up. Um, to, to, to really make concrete progress, we would like to explicitly find these conjectures sectors labeled by multiple SO2 representations in the SYK model. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how to do this. Um, and a warm-up problem would be for us to understand what this k inch 2 by k measure might mean from the point of view of physics. Um, and what I mean by this is that so far I showed explicitly that the um, beckstein hawking entropy and JT gravity can be mapped to this measure. And I think this, this kind of puts a new mathematical perspective on the, um, on the, on the beckstein hawking entropy. But, but I don't know how to write down a physically well-motivated system where by um, tracing over some subsystem and taking the model of HP, we would get back exactly this case in two by k. Um, now, for for a compact gauge group, we do know how to do this. There, the analogous uh, measure dim of R can be understood as physically counting the correlation between the magnetic indices of two maximally entangled static charges in representation R. But when we go up to this non-compact case, so first, first of all, the representations become infinite dimensional. So, um, so this very naive interpretation doesn't work without also some story for how, for, for why we would modify the trace. Um, and a second subtlety is that this, uh, this case is two by K is the plantron measure not for ordinary SL2R, but for a, a semi-group of SL2R, we restrict only positive elements of the matrices. Um, and, and I don't know of any pre-existing examples in physics where this semi-group plays a role. Um, now, the, but now this question of, of understanding what this measure might mean in physics seems potentially more tractable if we would go up a dimension, because there, this um, this semi group will turn out to be replaced by a quantum group, and the physical meaning of quantum groups in CFTs um, seems to have been somewhat better understood. So, um, so, so, so let me now move on to the last part of this talk, where I'll derive and interpret an analogous formula for a generic two D CFT with a gravity dual. Uh, how, how much time do I have, by the way? You have you have time. <laughs> you have time. <laughs> okay. I, I started I started at four, four thirty. Yeah, you started a few minutes late, and uh, yeah, just just. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, this should, this should probably only take like fifteen minutes or something. Um, right. So so in this in this last part, um, I want to revisit this this familiar problem of uh, of computing the entanglement entropy of a single interval in the ground state of a holographic two D CFT. Now, now the, the, the answer is well known. It's this famous C over three, like L over epsilon at leading order in epsilon, where um, L is the length of the interval, C is the central charge of the CFT, and um, epsilon is the newbie cutoff scale. Um, on the other hand, this answer is also supposed to describe the area of some um, RT surface in ADS3, and it's really the interpretation of that area term that um, I'd like to understand. Um, so, so again, uh, I'll take the approach of, of trying to rewrite this in terms of some group theoretic measure and then interpret it by analogy to an entanglement entropy formula that comes from an extension of a compact gauge theory. Um, so, so let me first quickly remind you how the, the usual way that we, we 
derive this result. Um, so we first, um, again, compute the n replicated partition function and then plug it into the replication formula from some slides back. Um, here, here, because we're now working with a quantum field theory on the boundary instead of just a tensor product of um, quantum mechanical systems, um, the starting point for this calculation will be a small subtlety that's um, sometimes glossed over in the literature that I think we, we, we discussed earlier, um, which is that entanglement entropy calculations are really only defined with respect to um, tensor product factorizations of a Hilbert space on the one hand, um, but in, but in continuum QFTs, the Hilbert space doesn't actually factorize. So to define an entanglement entropy in any QFT, we, we should actually start by explicitly forcing the Hilbert space to factorize. Um, and we can do this by cutting out a small region around the entangling boundary and putting some boundary conditions there by hand. Um, when we do this to a CFT on an interval, putting some conformal boundary conditions A1 and A2 at the ends of the cut, it means that the n replicated partition function um, for the single interval will actually live on a space with the topology of a cylinder with those um, same conformal boundary conditions at the ends of the cylinder. Um, so, so now, now taking a closed string shadow approach to computing this, um, this partition function, um, we can compute it as a propagator between the boundary states. Um, and if we then insert a complete set of states that couple to, um, to, to A1 and A2, the lowest energy among them will dominate as we send epsilon to zero, um, which puts Zn in this form at the bottom where we can isolate the, um, the end dependence in some exponential term from some boundary entropy like prefactors. Um, and plugging this guy into the replica trick formula gets back this famous C over three log O over epsilon result. Like, just a quick question. Maybe this is irrelevant, but uh, don't don't we usually uh, interpret Cardi's calculation? So this is a more sophisticated calculation. Cardi's calculation as the insertion of uh, instead of states A one and A two, you insert mm -hmm. identity. So you know these are boundary states. So I can I can replace them with the insertion of operator inside the path integral of that little disk that you removed, mm -hmm. and you're just inserting identity in there. Right? Am I am I interpreting this correctly for Cardi's calculation? So here you're just inserting some non-trivial state a one and a two. Um. Yeah. Then the, the choice of a one and a two doesn't matter for the leading formula. It doesn't leading doesn't matter for the leading c over three like over epsilon. Yes. So, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. This is this is like a, I think maybe a, like you could probably do this calculation in like in like a paragraph with twist operators or something. This is like. I'm setting it up this way because it's, it'll be easier for me to rewrite in the next slide. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, so what I want to do now is, is again, rewrite this thing in a first order form as a, a group theoretic measure evaluated at the peak of a probability distribution, um, which will put us in a position to interpret it by analogy to some compact gauge theory toy model where we know the exact underlying density matrix. Um, so in, in this case, this first step of rewriting it will be a little bit more complicated than before. And we'll split it up into two substeps. Um, first, we will relate this um, the entanglement result to the Cardi formula for one of the two boundary CFTs that we split our CFT into when we force the Hilbert space to factorize. Um, and then we'll relate the Cardi formula to a quantum group measure when we specialize the holographic CFTs. Um, so, so to relate the entanglement entropy to the Cardi formula for one of the boundary CFTs. Um, what we'll do is, is um, take, take the starting point from two slides ago, but instead compute um, this cylinder partition function in the open street channel as the Sorry. thermal part. Yeah. I apologize for the interruption. I'm, I'm looking yeah, no, no, that's good. Uh, so in comparison with the previous calculation, mm -hmm. uh, in the previous calculation, you had a quantum mechanical system on the, on the boundary. So you went to the bulk. The gravity in the bulk was a SL2R gauge theory. And then you mm -hmm. did the calculation there. So in two plus one dimensions, the bulk theory is SL2R cross SL2R. So you have two copies of that. And, but you're not doing that. You're not taking the Z, you're not taking the partition function of SL2R cross SL2R. You're now doing everything on the boundary. Yeah, I mean, like technically, technically in the previous calculation, I was also doing everything on the boundary. I then just like interpreted one particular term as a term that you could match to the, to the um, area term. Yeah, that, that, that's some, the thing that confuses me because the, the, from the point of view of the boundary, this gauge theory is, 
I mean, it's just a quantum mechanical system. What is this gauge theory? What are these cuts? What is it? What is the entropy that we're calculating? Which degrees of freedom are entangled with which degrees of freedom? Um, so you, you now mean in the in the previous example? Yes. Say quantum yes. Mechanical system. yes. yes. Um, Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, I, I guess, like, like if you if you compute, the, like, like the computation we're always doing is between like two boundary subsystems, right? So it's like, like yeah. you can say that like the RT formula is also computing the entanglement entropy of some um, of of like some some boundary subsystem. It's just like in in variables that look more natural from the bulk point of view. I see. So you want to interpret the previous calculation also as a boundary calculation? All right. Thank you. Yeah, uh, or it's like it's like. Like the actual calculation you're doing can be thought of as like some Schrodinger partition function or some bulk first order partition function, and it's like the same. It's like sort of the same formula by definition. But then um, I sort of just um, just point out that one way of massaging the terms makes the area term look like this group theory measure. Thank you. Um, yeah. So 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 here I, I want to do the same thing and and rewrite this. Um, the and the entropy across an interval in this first order form as a group theory measure evaluated at the peak of a probability distribution, um, so that we'll, we can again play the same game. Um, and to do this, I will compute the cylinder partition function in um, as a thermal partition function for one of the boundary CFTs. Over here, um, it's rho delta is the density of states. Um, and then, and then I'll do the same technical trick as in the earlier parts of this talk and take the integrand of this. Uh, this uh, z, z sub n to define this distribution p delta. Um, re rewriting this uh, z sub n in terms of it, um, uh, we can express the entanglement entropy across an interval in, in this way at the bottom that resembles these formulas from the earlier parts of the talk. Um, so so these, these are steps you can do for a CFT with any central charge. Um, but for a generic CFT, this distribution p delta will be wide. So it's not like a very interesting um, way of, of looking at things. But if we um, further specialize to the CFTs with large central charge, then this distribution will become sharply peaked due to competing exponentials in the um, density of states and in the e to the beta h term, which will cause the entanglement entropy to become dominated by the density of states evaluated, um, evaluated at, at some particular value of delta, the peak of p delta, similar to what we saw in the previous examples. Um, so, so indeed, you can explicitly check that this bottommost formula is true, which uh, sort of had to work. Um, right, so, 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 so to summarize here, um, the integral entropy across the interval in the ground state of a 2D CFT can be rewritten in terms of the Cardi formula for any CFT, and in particular to the Cardi formula evaluated at a certain L over epsilon dependent level in a holographic CFT. Um, and now, now to further massage this formula into one that will directly resemble the earlier results, um, so that we can, we can use, the, use, use the machinery of this analogy. Um, we can then use an observation that the Cardi formula at large level delta um, approximately agrees with a Planchard measure for, the, for a quantum group, this quantum deformation of SL2R under this mapping of parameters, um, where this deformation parameter Q is related to the central charge of the CFT, and the level delta um, gets matched to some principal continuous representation in the quantum group. Um, so, so we can, if we, if we now repeat this open string channel calculation with this additional approximation, we get to this formula at the bottom, which is like directly analogous to the one I found back in part one um, for vacuum JT gravity or for the 2D A Mills on S1 toy model, where now the measure in this formula is this control measure of this quantum group. Um, and as a sanity check, we can again see that evaluating this measure at the peak of the probability distribution gives back the famous C over three log over epsilon. Um, right, so, 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 so indeed this step of finding a family of density matrices who's Sorry, one can I, can I interrupt? Can you go back yeah. to group? So this quantum group that you wrote down, Oh, sorry, sorry. This, this is the thing that confused me. So this is a quantum group of SL to R, but don't you, in 2D CFTs, don't you have two copies of it? Yeah, um, the the thing whose measure appears in the um, in, in these area formulas is never the same as the gauge group. It wasn't the same in the previous example either. Um, 
Yeah, that, that confuses me. Okay, maybe maybe we could talk about this offline. Thank you. Yeah, so so I, I guess you should, for now you should think of this group as like some auxiliary group that I'm that I'm going to interpret in a couple of slides, but it's it's not the same as the as the gauge group. All right, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, so so in this in this case, this um this this formula exactly re resembles the one from Portland, so we could just pull over the toy model from that case. Um, and so here's the comparison slide, right? So we we can approximately rewrite the entanglement entropy of a single interval two D CFT in this way at the top. Um, row here is the plantar measure of this quantum group, um, and the um, leading C over three log O over epsilon or RT area term gets matched to it. Um, on the other hand, previously we found that this uh, second formula was the explicit von Neumann entropy of this uh, of this density matrix. Um, and if we assume that the CFT result comes from an underlying density matrix with the same superselection sector structure, we would um, be led to conjecture that each holographic CFT should approximately have states labeled by, um, by, by representations of this quantum group. And each, each boundary CFT that we split the CFT into when we do an entanglement calculation should approximately have sectors also labeled by um, representations of this quantum group. And this, this slide is actually an exact copy of the slide for step three from part one of the talk. Um, now, now to this, it's 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 quite tempting to add a third conjecture that I I, I haven't yet checked, but I'm in the process of checking. Um, so, so in part two of this talk, we, we saw that um, when when we added matter to the um, Euclidean path integral for SYK JT holography, we we wound up with the conjecture that each of the SYK models should have Hilbert space sectors that are actually labeled by any number of representations of this uh, SL2R semi group. Um, if we assume that things will work the same way here, um, then we might. We, we, we might want to conjecture that the holographic boundary CFTs should approximately have Hilbert space sectors labeled by any number of representations of this, uh, of this quantum group. Um, so, so we are now like we're getting very close to the end of the talk. So I'm going to speculate wildly for, for the next two slides. Um, so, so, so far I, I've just told you what happens if we directly generalize the results from the SYKJT examples to holography in one higher dimension. Um, but as, as I mentioned earlier, one of the motivations to, to study this, uh, to go up a dimension, is that we better, we better understand the physics associated with quantum groups than with this, um, this, this positive semigroup in the SYKJT case. Um, namely, according to some, some work from like the 80s, there's supposed to be a pairing between quantum groups and CFTs, where for every CFT, there's supposed to be some associated quantum group who's um, whose uh, six J symbols can be converted in some known way to breeding and fusion matrices of that CFT. Um, under this pairing, conformal families of the CFT get mapped to um, representations of the quantum group. Um, and, and the pleasure measure for the quantum group is supposed to be a natural spectral density on the space of conformal blocks in the CFT. Um, so so these, are, these are things that are supposed to be true for like any CFT. And specializing to this, um, this, this um, deformation of SL2R in particular, it's, it seems to be associated to the duality data in the Ville CFT with a continuous spectrum of some central charge that depends on Q. So, so on the one hand, according to, to, to um, this, this collection of, anal of analogies that I was developing in this talk, um, holographic boundary CFTs may approximately have Hilbert space sectors that are labeled by any number of representations of this quantum group. Um, according to the, some pre-existing known physics around quantum groups, um, representations of this group can in turn be matched to conformal primaries in Liouville CFT, and this plantar measure to the spectral density on the space of conformal blocks in Liouville CFT. So if we if we would put these things together and identify our Hilbert space sectors labeled by like vectors of representations of this group with the space of conformal blocks for the associated primaries in Liouville CFT, we get back to these um these this picture from the start of this talk that um, in, in 3D gravity, there may exist some approximate description of space itself as being built from some like conformal block-like um, degrees of freedom that redundantly encode semi-classical states in the sense that I described in part two, where the RT area terms can be rewritten as plantural measures for this quantum group that tell us how to glue together the legs of these, um, of these different conformal blocks. Um, so, so let me emphasize that in these last two slides, I'm sort of on, on doubly speculative ground since I'm combining unproven conjectures that I've made with these analogies to conjectures other people have made around this work on quantum groups and CFTs from the 90s. So, so you can decide how seriously you want to take these last two slides. Um, 
but to, to, to step back onto more solid ground and conclude. Um, so, so, right, so, so, so here's, here's the summary. Um, so, so in this talk, I, I rewrote entanglement entropy between boundary subregions in holographic states in a first order way across a number of examples. Um, and in each case, I found a matching non-gravitational toy model that gave rise to a similar looking entropy formula. Um, where in the toy model, we could write down the exact density matrix that was responsible for the entropy formula. Um, and in the course of following the strategy, um, uh, we showed that um, the Brief Takenagi or Bagstein Hawking area terms in each of these examples could be matched to some Planchot measure for an SL2R semi group or quantum group in two and three dimensions, respectively. Um, we conjectured based on a fairly explicit analogy to these toy models that the Hilbert spaces of boundary subregions in, um, in these holographic theories should split into sectors labeled by representations of these groups. And we sort of more, more speculatively conjectured by combining our conjectures with ones from elsewhere um, about how quantum groups may be realized in physics, that the underlying picture in, in a three-dimensional quantum gravity may be one where the, the atoms of space are conformal block-like things with RT area terms quantifying how to glue together the legs of the different blocks. Um, so, so what comes next? So um, in, in the short term, it would be good to generalize this uh, 2D CFT calculation to, to, first of all, include matter in the Euclidean path integral that sets up the state, which is probably not too hard, or to, to multiple intervals, um, which is probably much harder since then we would no longer have the analog of the naive open string channel that I'm, I'm playing around with some ideas. Um, uh, basically, we would like to collect all possible kinematic data that we can from our technical trick of rewriting um, these entanglement entropies that we set up by path integral in some first order way. Um, in, in the long term, we would like to explicitly find these conjectured um, Hilbert space sectors labeled by SO2 representations in uh, subsystems of low dimensional holography. Um, um, unfortunately, I, I, I don't know how to get started on this, um, but I also am like really not familiar with working directly with either the SYK model or with generic boundary CFTs. So if you have suggestions, please, please, please let me know. Um, and then in the, in the really long term, like we would all like to understand how to reorganize um, the boundary theories and holographic um, duality to make holography manifest and see what black hole physics looks like in that direction, in that description. So the, um, the, the somewhat immodest hope of this talk um, is that this way of reorganizing entanglement calculations that I described here may actually be telling us something about the correct variables with which to naturally formulate um, such a theory, but um, it remains to be seen if this will turn out to be the case. Um, and that, that's all I prepared. So, so yeah, th thanks, thanks again for the invitation. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It was a great talk. Um, are there any questions? Um, Mary, <clears throat> sorry, in these next steps, because some 2D CFT can be like, for example, the bulk ADS3 cross S7, so it's like really 10 dimensional or some. So, so the three, you don't have really three dimensional gravity, but you would say that there is this. I don't know if that's what you are doing in the second paragraph here, saying that there will be a subsector. This UQ should be a subsector of maybe a bigger group associated with the CFT or whenever you have gravity and... um yeah I'm, I'm conjecturing that whenever you have a holographic CFT you would you would always have um sectors labeled by by these um representations based on just the structure of like like ADS3 CFT2 but I guess you could have extra structure from the extra dimensions but I haven't thought about that thank you are there any other questions for Jennifer? I have one question actually. So you mentioned this uh, during your talk as a question, but uh, I guess we didn't come back to it. Uh, that in the case of a, a compact gauge theory, the uh, the that DMR that you find is an integer, which is like the dimension of a Hilbert space associated with that representation. That got replaced with the Planck-Curl measure. Now, is there a dimension interpretation of this? Are we, what, what is the interpretation of this? Because we wanted to get an interpretation, right? Yeah, this, I mean, this thing is related to this um, um, quantum dimension, which is like, 
it's, I mean, it's, well, first, it's, it's not an integer. I think there's like, there's in like some asymptotic limits, you can relate it to some dimension of like some tensor product of many copies of this Hilbert space divided by some other thing that I forget. But there's like, so there's like some sort of asymptotic counting interpretation in that sense, but there's no direct counting interpretation. I see. So there's no uh, direct understanding of that. Okay. Yeah. And that, 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 that's like, to me, one of the most confusing questions is like, what, what to make of this, uh, this thing from a physics point of view. Have, have people discussed uh, non -comp uh, entanglement entropy for non-compact gauge theories? Yeah, are, is there literature on this? I, I guess that's, that's, that's exactly where it would appear. Yeah, right. So it's basically not as far as I can tell. All right. Thank you. Um, any last questions for Jennifer? If not, let's thank Jennifer again, virtually. Hey, thank you. Yeah, and, thanks again uh, for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Um,